even better than that, we have great questions that have already been sent in. And as you hear us talk, definitely post more questions. Um, there's a Q and A, and I and I'm hi, I'm Amber Salzman. I'll be moderating it and making sure that the questions are answered. So let, let's first do intros, and I'll ask people in the order that they'll then be giving a talk. So Carrie, maybe you can introduce yourself and a little background. Sure. Um, so my name is Carrie Chow. I am a genetic counselor. I currently work with Natera, which is a laboratory that performs um, testing um, in the embryo um, realm. Um, prior to that, I worked actually with Seattle Reproductive Medicine um, with IVF patients and with their egg donor program and embryo donor program. And prior to that, I was in mostly prenatal high risk, but I've kind of been all over the place, but most of my career has done with prenatal genetics. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest, I'm from um, Missouri, but I went to graduate school on the East Coast and then kind of headed back this way. Um, I worked in Missouri and I worked at Northwestern in Chicago and then ended up actually in Seattle, which is where I currently live now with my kids. Um, and I'm super excited to be part of this. So thank you very much. Thanks, Carrie. Sarah, if you could give uh, your background and introduce okay. yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm, um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I am Dr. Sarah Vaughn, and I am a uh, infertility specialist, reproductive endocrinologist in the Bay Area. I practice in Sunnyvale, which is close to Palo Alto, where I live. Um, and adrenal leukodystrophy is just a topic that is near and dear to my heart because it's a genetic mutation that runs in my family. And so I found out that a cousin of mine, um, my mother's sister's son, um, had adrenal leukodystrophy. And I found out that information when I was about 23 years old and just having started my journey in medical school. And it ended up being really one of the defining features that drove me into the field of reproductive medicine um, because I learned all about um, embryo screening and what kind of power my field gives women and couples um, options for in terms of just controlling um, their and having, having sort of the power of control over their health. So I ended up being very lucky that I'm not a carrier my female cousin is a carrier and my male cousin um, uh, recently passed away on, in, in January. And so um, I feel really honored to be here and to be educating patients you know, um, in his honor and with, with my family. Um, and it's something that I do now on a daily basis to screen embryos for genetic health. And so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you more about how that process works. Wonderful, and, and Troy? Yeah, hello, I'm Dr. Troy Lund. I am a pediatric bone marrow transplant specialist at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I do a lot of clinical care for boys with, boys with cerebral ALD. Also have a research lab that investigates questions uh, about the same thing as well. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, HLA typing and transplantation and kind of how it's all done. Thanks. And hi, I'm Amber Salzman. I um, have the privilege of moderating this panel. And the reason why this is so near and dear, I mean, it's obviously very dear to all of us. I've been involved with ALD patient advocacy and therapy development for 20 years. And 20 years ago, when my um, oldest nephew was diagnosed, my son was one year old at the time. And when I thought, how am I going to have more children that are healthy, and then learned about the significance in HLA matching, I went through IVF cycles myself, actually several of them, to try to get an embryo that was unaffected and an HLA match for my son. As it turned out, um, after a few cycles, we only had unaffected but not HLA matches. So they were put in the freezer and my son had a cord blood transplant. He's now a healthy 21 year old. Um, but I, after his transplant was successful, I went back and transferred one of the frozen ones, and my daughter is now a healthy 17 year old, unaffected um, as a result of the process. So I'm very grateful for the science and having my, having my family. But the other thing I should say why I'm very passionate. So I've been in farm and biotech my whole life. And a couple of years ago, I was recruited to run a company, Ohana Bioscience, and our uh, we're, we have a sperm biology platform with products to improve the success rates of IVF. So this is an area both personally, professionally, and like every cell in my body is passionate about. So it's truly my pleasure. 
So um, if we can start maybe from the uh, genetic counseling side, knowing that we have people who they themselves are affected with ALD or they have family members, men, women, uh, et cetera. Uh, Carrie, if you can maybe help start from that position, what they should do. Sure. Um, I actually had just a few slides. I'm going to see if I can share my screen and put them up. Um, let's see if that works. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me get it to the beginning here. So yeah, I wanted to talk about um, the actual process of testing at the embryo level, which is uh, referred to as PGT testing. Um, previously, nomenclature for this type of testing was referred to as PGD. So sometimes you might see that um, when you're reading about this. Um, PGT is a newer um, uh, nomenclature pre um, pre-implantation genetic testing. And when we think about testing for a gene or a mutation, something like a variant in the um, the ALG gene, it will be referred to as PGTM. So you'll see that M coming after it. And that's referring to that specific type of testing at the embryo level. When I was thinking about the information that I wanted to share with you guys today, I really kind of came up with five bullet points that I want you to kind of take home. So I made them really kind of straightforward, but I really want everyone to walk away from this realizing that thinking about testing at the embryo level is a process. Um, it is involved. This is not something that you would call someone like Dr. Vaughn and say, hey, I want to do IVF next month and I want to test my embryos for this condition. Um, laboratories need time to prep. Um, we need to build platforms. There's the testing of the samples. There's going through IVF. There's achieving a pregnancy. There's the time of pregnancy. So if somebody is going to head down this pathway, they need to have an understanding about that it is a process. There are many steps. And in conjunction with that is time. There is an investment of time. You need to consider time, especially I think when um, somebody is interested in doing testing at the embryo level for HLA matching, depending on what the need is for the match, you have to go through all of these things to get that matching embryo. You need a successful um, transplant, uh, implantation or transfer. And then we have pregnancy time and need the birth of, of baby. So it's just important to keep these things in mind um, when you're thinking about, is this a good option for you? There will be sample collection. And I think a lot of people don't realize before entering this, we most labs are going to ask for different things, um, samples from the couple, from relatives, from an affected individual in the family. So this involves other people. It can often require additional testing. Um, so again, it may not be we're ready to go. We might ask for different family members to be tested. And I want to highlight um, the option of routine carrier testing and the role that it plays as you're going through this process. So to really kind of highlight these five points and what this process looked like, I wanted to kind of walk you through um, two different case examples that we have done at the company that I work for um, to kind of show you how we approach it and what we're going to ask and what you're going to need. The first thing in highlighting the process and time, I wanted to highlight the difference between if you yourself are getting worked up to see if you're a carrier or if you're an individual who has this diagnosis and you're being worked up to find out what mutation or variant you carry, you're gonna get a blood draw and you're gonna send a tube of blood to a genetic laboratory. They are going to have millions of cells to work with. They're gonna have this huge volume of DNA and they're gonna look at the gene responsible. So in this case, they're gonna look at that ABCD1 gene that's responsible for ALD and they're gonna look for any kind of mutation or variant. When we start talking about PGTM, we are not testing on a blood sample anymore. We are testing on an embryo biopsy. So I use this picture and Dr. Vaughn will probably expand on this, but when you're going through IVF, we're having that egg and sperm and fertilization happening in the lab. And we are watching an embryo grow to what we refer to as the blastocyst or the day five stage. And the embryologist at the clinic is going to do a biopsy and they are going to pull a few cells from this um, outer cell later, which is referred to as the trophoectoderm. And in this slide that is pictured as the, the circle in red on that blastocyst. So we get as a laboratory, five, six, seven cells. And it is amazing to get that from an embryo. But the difference in DNA amount 
is huge. So for a laboratory working with an embryo biopsy versus a laboratory working with a blood sample, we have a lot of challenges. And the biggest challenge is the amount of DNA we get. And this is why it is a process. We cannot test the same way that we test in a blood sample. We actually have to prepare and know what we're looking for and build a test platform to do this. And the primary reason is because of the sample we're working with. We don't get a lot of DNA and we've got to manipulate that DNA and we've got to copy it and it lends itself to different um, problems or considerations that we have ways of working around, but it takes time. So for many um, labs, I can't, uh, there's not a lot of labs that do embryo testing. And obviously I'm going to speak to the experience with my lab, but we will review cases up front and determine how we need to do them and what samples we're going to need um, because this is what we're going to work with. And this is kind of the, the limiting factor. We're going to get a few cells and a small amount of DNA. This is also why when you get into this realm, I think what's surprising to patients is they might know the variant in their family and they did their blood test and the lab came back in quick time and said, here's, yep, here's that variant. When we go to test at the embryo level, we cannot go and pick up a variant by itself the same way you do in blood. That's referred to as direct detection. Um, because we've manipulated that DNA so much, we worry if we're not seeing it, is it really negative? So ultimately what a lab is gonna do for you is build something. We're gonna build a primer or a DNA tag is the best way to think of it that is going to track your variant uniquely. So all of this is a process and it is time consuming, but it's really tied to the sample that we're working with. So the first case I wanted to share with you here is um, one where the couple came in, they have no history of infertility, but they are considering pursuing the IVF and PGTM for the ALD. And as shown here, this is a case where the patient is reporting a maternal uncle diagnosed, but who's passed. Um, so they know that the maternal grandmother is an obligate carrier. And in talking to the patient, she relays that she thinks her grandmother had symptoms later in life. And the patient's mother had not done DNA testing, but was documented to be a carrier based on some biochemical testing. So the patient is the first in her family and she does complete DNA testing. Um, and she's found to carry this specific variant in the gene. So she actually comes into the conversation or working with the genetic counselor at the lab with this information. And what we do is we take all of that into account and start thinking about how can we do this for the patient? What are we gonna need? And I just wanted to throw this up to show you that the ABCD1 gene is at the very end of the chromosome. It's this tiny little part at the bottom of the X chromosome. And if you've not looked at genes and DNA, this kind of looks like a jumbled mess. But what I wanted to show you on the side is that's actually the ABCD1 gene and it's showing different locations of all of the mutations. And for this case specifically, this person's mutation is in the box number nine. And it's just a tiny little variant. And what we're gonna decide is how are we gonna pick that little bitty variant where it is at the end of this gene up in an embryo biopsy. So in discussing with this, the lab, the patient said up from the start, she said, I don't really want to include my parents. Um, can we do this testing without having any samples? They know about this disorder, but we really haven't shared going through IVF and screening embryos. And this is not a common um, story. We get this request a lot. We really don't want to tell anybody else in the family we're doing this. But when we reviewed the case, what the team decided is we would want a sample from the patient and her partner, but we would, we would require saliva samples from um, both of her parents. And the reason for this is where her little variant is in the gene, the DNA in that region, it's actually um, a duplicated region. There's sequences that look exactly like the mutation right there. And us trying to pick that up without looking at the region coming from her parents would be impossible. So we came back to her saying, if you want the lab to do this, we are going to need additional samples. So again, you have to know going into this process that you have to be comfortable that a laboratory might say, we've got to include relatives. You may need to be getting and talking to relatives and saying, you know, we are doing IVF. We are going to be testing embryos for this. And the lab would like a DNA sample on you. Um, in this particular case, we also asked for a copy of her mother's carrier status report, even though it wasn't DNA, it helps to confirm. Um, we always like to see confirmation. 
And so the language we use is that, okay, we would do this case and we would do it by phasing. And what that means is we are going to build a primer or a DNA tag that is going to recognize hundreds of different DNA sequences around this person's variant and check and look for all of those data points at the embryo level. This keeps the accuracy really high. We counseled this couple that the chance if you give us an embryo biopsy that it's going to meet all the criteria that it is chromosomally normal because we always do full chromosome testing as well and that it is unaffected was going to be 31%. And you can see I put below kind of where does that number come from? There's a background chance every time you're creating an embryo for a chromosome change. So that was a 62%. And then there's a 50% chance of passing the X with the ALD variant. So this kind of highlights when you come into this realm, often we talk about how many embryos can we test and it's not easy to get a lot of embryos, um, but you need to be really kind of cognizant that we will find embryos that cannot be used. They will inherit the gene. They will have a chromosome disorder. Um, and so we're really transparent upfront. What do we think the chances are if you give us an embryo biopsy that you're gonna get a normal result? So for this couple, they actually submitted 11, which is a pretty big number. I don't always get that many for a round of testing. And this is what we saw. We had two meet the both criteria. They were chromosomally normal, which is what euploid's referring to. We want the right number of chromosomes. Um, and then they were normal. They did not inherit the um, ALD variant. We had nine that were abnormal. Um, and you can see it was a different combination. We had a percent that had chromosome changes, but were unaffected with ALD. We had some that had both problems, chromosome and ALD. And then we had two that were chromosomally normal, but did have the X um, with the ALD variant. So again, they submitted 11, they walked away with two. It is also important to realize we have two good embryos to consider transfer now. But a, a chromosomally normal unaffected embryo does not equal 100% transfer rate. And again, Dr. Vaughn will probably speak to this, um, but it's great to have two after this cycle, but it's again, not necessarily a huge number, nor does it ensure a successful transfer. The other example I wanted to kind of walk you through is if somebody was requesting this type of testing for an ABCD1 variant and wanted HLA matching. So this is a recent case um, we're working on where we have a patient who has a son who's diagnosed at a pretty young age, and she was tested and confirmed to be a carrier of this specific variant and the ABCD1 gene. And interestingly, after she's tested and her son was tested, other family members started to be tested, and she had a nephew who was also diagnosed, um, and then her mother actually completed DNA testing. So again, this is a case where they're coming into the lab with a lot of DNA testing being done. Had this testing not been done prior to us, but we have a clinical diagnosis, we would require that this patient have DNA testing. We must know the variant she carries. We can't do a general um, ABCD1 screen. But she again comes in with a lot of information. A lot of relatives have been tested. Um, again, no history of infertility. They are pursuing IVF just for the PGTM for this variant, but now they're requesting HLA matching. So again, my team would review this case up front and take a look and see how would we do this? What would we ask of the couple and talk to them about it? In this particular case, we wanted samples from everybody. We wanted from the patient and partner. We wanted from both of the um, saliva from the patient's mom and dad. We also wanted saliva from her partner's parents because now we're gonna be doing HLA and we're gonna track chromosome six and the HLA um, points from both sides. So we want saliva samples from both um, parents to the patient and partner. Since they have a child who has a diagnosis, we wanted a cheek swab from the child. We will build those primers, those DNA tags to track all of these things, but we will use their son's sample actually like an embryo biopsy and do a pre-run. So we have a lot of checks and balances. So we were asking for a lot of samples in this case. And then again, we wanted a copy of um, the patient's mother's DNA report documenting her carrier status. And again, the language we used is phasing, meaning we're creating a primer, we're tracking regions where you're not trying to pick up her variant directly. So going into this, we counseled the patient that if you send us one embryo biopsy, that a chance it would meet all of the criteria was 
she was a similar age to the other patient. So she had a 62% chance for um, a chromosomally normal embryo. We had a 50% chance of passing the normal X uh, without the ALD variant. And then we have a 25% chance for an HLA match. So the more things that we are testing an embryo biopsy for, there is more um, you know, layers that have to be met, more criteria, it is going to take a larger number. It is not to be discouraging, it is not that we cannot find these, but if you only sent one or two with an 8% chance, there's a very good chance we're not gonna find one that meets all of that criteria. For this couple, they have done two cycles with us so far. We are not getting huge embryo biopsy numbers at a time. So in the first cycle, we had two embryo biopsies and we did not have any normals. Um, we had one that did not have ALD, but it was aneuploid, meaning it had a chromosome abnormality and it was actually a mismatch. The other embryo was chromosomally abnormal and specifically the chromosome problem that it had was what's called triploidy. It has three copies of every chromosome. So once you have three copies of every chromosome, that means we have three sex chromosomes, i.e. potentially three Xs, which means three copies of the ALD gene. And we already have too many chromosome number six to make an HLA match. So we can't even make a call on those two because we have too much DNA. So kind of the short story is they did not have any embryos suitable to transfer. So they cycled again. We got another two embryo biopsies. And again, we have no normal results. Um, the first one was affected. It got the um, variant of concern with the ALD. It was chromosomally normal, but it was a mismatch. Then we had another one that was affected, again, chromosomally um, normal, but actually an HLA match. So you can see, you can get pieces of the criteria that you wish, but finding that embryo that matches all of them is challenging. So now we have tested four for this couple and have not found it. Um, they are gearing up to cycle again. So they are going to attempt a third cycle. I think that's the last slide. So outside of that, um, the last thing I wanted to mention with my few minutes is when you go through this process, I think you any family that has an inherited disorder in the family and they're thinking about testing at the embryo level, they are focused on that gene change. They are focused on ALD. They're focused on HLA matching. But when you come into this process, um, I would also want you to be thinking, and I think a lot of IVF providers will be thinking this and talk to you about this, to not forego some general background carrier screening. Meaning there are very big panels that people can send in a blood test and see, do they carry genes for other common disorders? Things like cystic fibrosis, fragile X, spinal muscular atrophy. I think sometimes we are so focused on what is going on in the family and is our immediate concern. We don't always do that. We're not concerned about that. These things are common. We all carry a lot of recessive genes. Um, I have had cases where we build primers, we test embryos for a disorder, and we have a baby born with cystic fibrosis that we did not do. Carrier screening was not done for that family. So I think it's something to consider when you're in this process to make sure that there's nothing else we should be testing an embryo for. You don't want to have so many test criteria that we can't find one. But at the same time, you would not want to do the investment of IVF and primer development and testing embryos and transfer and forego something that is very common that we could have screened for. Um, so carrier testing varies greatly. There are a lot of labs that do this. There are all sorts of sizes of panels, how many things you can be screened for. Generally your OB or your IVF provider, maybe a primary care provider could offer it. But if somebody is really thinking about heading down this pathway, I would really encourage them to also consider that as part of planning and prepping and going into this being prepared um, because it is really um, disheartening for it to come up on the back end. And it is a lab, it has happened more than once. Um, so that would be kind of my last kind of piece of advice thinking about this. Thank you so much, Carrie. One question came up while you're speaking. If you can just address um, quickly, I mean, you talked about obviously the mother having ALD and what kind of testing you had to do. If the father has ALD, um, of course, all of his daughters will be carriers, the sons will not. So could you just briefly say what's involved? Yeah. 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 So I think in that scenario, and it hasn't come up as much because it, it typically it wouldn't be a PGTM case at that point, because looking for 
his X chromosome, it's going to be there in any of the females. So we typically wouldn't build a primer. I think in those scenarios, what would probably be offered to that couple if there is a desire to stop passing this variant in the family, which is definitely a desire we have on a lot of different genetic conditions. We don't even want carriers. We want to stop this going through the family. Would probably be to do general PGTA or chromosome testing and do sex selection. Select embryos that are male. Um, there's always options of prenatal diagnosis, just not doing IVF, going into pregnancy and doing prenatal testing. That can be done as early as you know 11 weeks in pregnancy, I think a CVS can be done, 16 weeks in amniocentesis. Um, but if they really wanna go through the IVF realm, I think their provider would do straight PGTA and talk about gender selection and just, um, cause it really doesn't make sense to be testing for the variant we're going Thank through. Thank you. Yeah. So now we'll move to, to Sarah. So. I mean, I know Carrie just said, oh, and then you cycle again, like that was also just stop into a cycle. And as Sarah will tell you, unfortunately, that's all. But don't be scared, guys. I think it's good that I started with, I have a healthy 17 year old daughter. So good things come of this. And I yeah. went through a lot of cycles. So it's worth it. Um, and she was actually even a really good teenage girl. So it is really worth it. But Sarah will tell you what's involved in this cycle. So um, I want to talk to a couple of points. And I know that there are different types of patients out there, different types of people listening to this conversation. And so I think it warrants sort of bringing those groups into a couple of different groups. The first would be, um, you know, young men or young women who are affected by this disorder, who may not have their partner um, set up yet, or even thinking about having a partnership. And they're thinking about down the line, like I want to be a parent and I want to make sure that I can be a parent and I want to make sure that I, that, that that's really important to me. And that's the situation that I was in when I was 23. The first thought that came to my mind was that I knew I wanted to be a mom by the time I was about five. I knew I wanted to be a doctor by the time I was about 21, but I knew I wanted to be a mom by the time my brother came along. And so this is something that you might not be anywhere near ready for, but you're already thinking about how do I make sure I can have that happen? And so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, whether or not you can take measures to optimize that for you. The second is if you have your partner chosen already, regardless of whether or not you wanna to try to conceive now or you wanna to try to conceive in the future, there are slightly different options available um, to you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, in order to, to sort of cover ground on, 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 for all of these groups, we're going to talk a little bit about fertility, natural reproduction, um, and what we expect with time. Because as much as <laughs> I would love for it not to be the case, reproductive aging affects all of us at some point in time. Um, and particularly for, um, for men with adrenal leukodystrophy, that is actually a very, uh, a much smaller group where we might actually recommend doing something like freezing sperm, whereas reproductive aging doesn't affect men, adrenal leukodystrophy can affect male sexual function. And so um, being able to free, freezing sperm, if, um, if you're able to ejaculate is easy, it's easy to do, it's, it's not as expensive to do, um, and, and freezing eggs is a little harder to do. Um, but if you don't have a partner yet, that's the way to go about, you know, optimizing fertility um, and, and freezing embryos, um, like Dr. Salson said, ultimately, even if it's remote from when you're going to conceive in the future, um, may be a good option as well, because IVF outcomes are really related to two things. The first is your age. It's the most important factor. And I wish it weren't the case, but it is. And so what we all have the insight into knowing right now is what age we are right now. That's it. We don't know what age we're gonna to wanna to conceive necessarily. We don't know what age, if we do wanna conceive right away, we don't necessarily know what, at, at what age or what time point it will work for us, but we do know what age we are right now. The second thing is um, ovarian reserve. And that is a concept that essentially refers to how many eggs exist inside a woman's body that are at a specific stage of egg development that we can give you medication and we can cause multiple eggs to grow at the same time. The more eggs we get to grow, the more embryos we will have to choose from. And that number is also often related to age. So while it can vary in each individual, um, and I do think it's really important for everyone to know where they live on the spectrum within the realm of their reproductive goals, um, it does decrease in time. And it does decrease in time in a relatively predictable way. And so we can always talk about that, um, you know, and, and I would say that if you haven't 
Um, and if it's if fertility and having kids that are genetically related to you, because that's always the other option, right, would be an egg donor or a sperm donor. Um, but if having kids that are genetically related to you is a really important thing in your mind, then, then thinking about ways of optimizing it is, is, is a good idea. And seeing someone to get your basic ovarian reserve assessed um, is, is a good idea as well. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my slides too. So, and okay. Can you guys, what are you guys seeing right now? Are you seeing my presenter view? I have like, <laughs> let me fix this. No, we see the screen and then the, you know, the future slides. On. If, the, if this works, we can see it. <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay, can you see it like regular now? Yeah. Yes, very good. All right, so this is the, the general like decline in fertility that we see in all women throughout their reproductive lifespan. What we really see is that fertility is pretty stable in the 20s and early 30s, followed by a fairly rapid decline of natural fertility um, in the later 30s and early 40s. And so what that really amounts to is that in our 20s, even at max peak fertility, we have about a 25% chance per month of conceiving. By 30, this declines just a little bit. And between 30 and 40, our natural fertility declines quite a lot. So it declines to the point where natural chances of conception are about 5% per, per month for the first six months of trying to conceive. And this is completely unrelated to whether or not you have to screen embryos or eggs for additional things, but older eggs also have a, have, have a higher rates of complications of other things. So the miscarriage rate increases as we get older and also the risk of having a baby with Down syndrome, which is an extra copy of chromosome 21, um, increases as well, particularly as we get into our 40s. Still low absolute risk, but quite a big difference in relative risk. So we're gonna just back up a little bit and talk about natural fertility. So in natural fertility, the brain secretes a hormone that talks to the pituitary gland to tell the pituitary gland to secrete a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone. And follicle stimulating hormone acts on the ovaries to cause a follicle to grow. Now what's a follicle? A follicle is simply the name of an egg that's in an intermediate stage of development inside of the ovary that is by definition capable of responding to follicle stimulating hormone. We all have women have many, many, many more eggs at an earlier stage of development that are constantly, the ovary is constantly trying to recruit them to this stage. And many, many, many more are dying off each month. So we don't lose eggs or get older or reach menopause by ovulating a single egg each month. We're all born with about one to two million eggs. We lose about a thousand eggs each month by eggs just trying to get to this developmental stage to begin with. So follicle stimulating hormone in a natural cycle will be secreted just in the right amount to cause one egg to grow out of a group of eggs that are all the little potential eggs that could grow. And as that egg grows, it'll secrete other hormones that feed back on the brain and tell the brain, okay, we got the message. We, um, we're not kittens. We don't want to litter. And that single egg will ovulate. And as a, and, oh, I'm sorry, those, those hormones will turn off the follicle stimulating hormones so that we don't grow more eggs and that single egg will ovulate. So if you look on the upper right hand um, uh, part of this slide, this is what an ovary, a human ovary looks like on a transvaginal ultrasound. And it looks a little bit like a chocolate chip cookie. And each of the little black circles are called antral follicles. And all of those are intermediate stage developed eggs that could grow if they were exposed to enough follicle stimulating hormone. Now, after that egg ovulates, it gets picked up by the fallopian tube, hopefully. And then if, um, if this is a cycle where someone might, might be able to get pregnant, the sperm has to make it through the vagina, in through the cervix, in through the uterus, into the fallopian tube where early fertilization happens. And then the early embryo travels back into the uterus and implants. And if it implants, then we have a positive pregnancy test. And if it doesn't implant, then we don't get pregnant that month. And if it implants and stops growing, that's how a miscarriage occurs. 
So it warrants saying that when we do genetic testing of the embryo, we have to create it outside of the body, right? Which Carrie already shared with us. And the way that we ultimately do that IVF is we take the egg from the ovary and we take the sperm from the ejaculate and we create the embryo outside of the body. We screen it and then we put it back inside. And so that's called PGT, pre-implantation genetic testing. However, there is another option, which is that once the embryo has implanted, you can do, it's not called this, but you can do post-implantation genetic testing or early pregnancy screening, which um, our current methodologies for doing this would not be with a doctor like myself, but with a maternal fetal medicine doctor who is able to put a very small needle in through the vagina or in through the abdomen and biopsy some of the cells of the growing fetus of the placenta um, in that pregnancy, and they can do the same testing that way. But if they find a positive and someone wants to have an actionable thing where they don't have a child with that disease or they don't have a, a daughter that's a carrier, um, you know, risk of AMN, then they would have to go through a, um, a first trimester termination. And, and, and sometimes it's hard to get this testing done. And it's certainly something that a lot of people would feel uncomfortable doing, and it's more emotional to do that in some ways. And so that's really how this embryo testing before implantation um, developed and what the benefits are of that. Um, okay. So two things happen to the ovary with age, and this is why it's important to start thinking about this as soon as you know that you might be interested in um, and, and, and sort of think about what your goals are. So two things happen. The first is that the quality of the eggs decline, and that will number one, affect your natural fertility. And if you can choose to conceive by IVF and pre-implantation genetic testing, it'll also affect the yield of normal embryos that we have to begin with um, and the possibility or the probability that we would find both a normal embryo that's also unaffected. The second thing that happens is the number of eggs decline. And this does not affect natural fertility in any way because in each natural ovulatory cycle, you're only ovulating that single egg. You're only, you know, if you do get pregnant, you're only conceiving a single baby. There's not like a screening process. But with IVF, the number of eggs is really going to give us a bet, like the more eggs we get up to a certain safe amount, the more embryos we're going to be able to screen, looking for both a normal one and looking for from a, from a normal embryo perspective, and also looking for one that we can screen for a specific genetic disease like adrenal, adrenal disease. So when I say quality, what do I mean by quality? When I say quality, what I'm really referring to is the number of eggs that it takes to make a baby. And so the number of eggs that it takes to make a baby um, is pretty stable throughout our 20s and our 30s, but really starts to increase around the age of 35, 36. And the reason that that's happening is that eggs have to go through meiosis when they ovulate. They, have, they go through this first stage of meiosis when they ovulate, they go through the second stage when they fertilize. Well, what's meiosis? Meiosis is the division of the chromosomes. So that when an egg ovulates, it divides its chromosomes. And then when it fertilizes, it divides its chromosomes in half again. So that the correct number of chromosomes combine with the sperm that has the other 50% of the chromosomes that the embryo needs to give us an embryo with a normal number of chromosomes. And an embryo with a normal number of chromosomes is called a euploid embryo, and an embryo with an abnormal number of chromosomes is called an aneuploid embryo. So this is a picture on the right of an embryo, an egg going through that division, and you can see the little green strings are pulling the purple chromosomes to opposite sides of the cell. But women are born with all of the eggs that we have, and those eggs, as we get older, are older cells, and older cells are more likely to make errors when they go through, through things like cellular division. And so older eggs are more likely to have those green strings, those green spindles or strings break. And when those green strings break, what can happen is two chromosomes can go to one side of the cell and no chromosomes go to the other for one pair, for example. And so we end up with an egg with the wrong number of chromosomes contributing to the embryo, the wrong number of chromosomes. And then the embryo has the wrong number of chromosomes and is either more likely to not implant, be a miscarriage, or in rare cases, be a baby with a chromosomal abnormality. So the second thing that changes is the number of eggs change. 
And the number of eggs changing is actually a fairly slow linear decline. And so it's hard to know how many eggs you could get in a single IVF cycle unless you know where your starting off point is. And that's really what your ovarian reserve is. But this number gradually declines as we get older. And so if you had a crystal ball and knew that you were going to go through IVF, well, it's always going to be better to go through the first stage of IVF, which is really getting the eggs. So how do we do IVF? Well, essentially we take advantage of the fact that all of those follicles in the ovaries are capable of responding to follicle stimulating hormone. It's just that in a natural cycle, our body only makes enough to grow one. And so we give medications that shut down the signals from the brain. And then we give high dose injectable recombinant follicle stimulating hormone at a higher dose for a longer period of time that allows us to recruit typically about 50 to 80% of those eggs to grow. So not everybody is born the same, right? Some of us are taller, some of us are shorter, um, some of us have brown eyes, some of us have blue eyes, right? Like there's lots of traits within humans that vary but are still entirely normal. And ovarian reserve is one of those traits. And so at age 20, it is possible to have 25 follicles and it's also possible to have 10 follicles. And while that means absolutely nothing about your natural fertility, it does really affect how you would do in a single cycle of IVF. And so in any patient who I know might choose to do IVF at some point in the future, whether it is because they're delaying pregnancy a really long time and they might have an increased risk of infertility while they achieve their um, their, their, their goals in their career, or whether it's they have a known genetic mutation and this is their plan and they just haven't met their person yet, or they haven't figured out their plan for having kids yet, or whatever it is that causes you to delay your pregnancy. If you're less than the age of 30, you know, if you're planning on delaying past the age of 35, or you have a low number in here, you want to know about it sooner rather than later, because you may have at 25, if you have a low number, that might actually be the best time for you to make eggs, because you might, that might be the year that you could get enough conceivably to have a good chance of making embryos for the future. And part of the reason that is, um, really so limiting is because there's a drop off between eggs and embryos that is normal. In the best case scenarios, we see drop offs and we don't wanna plan on being lucky, like statistically where we're, we're, we're lucky in a rare way, but we wanna plan on having realistic goals. So someone who has 16 follicles, which is a very normal number for someone in their early twenties, um, when we go to stimulate them, we expect to get 50 to 80% of those follicles to grow and give us mature eggs. A mature egg is one that's gone through the first step of cellular division. And we can see that it's a mature egg because it extrudes this little web called a polar body that actually has half of the chromosomes that will disintegrate. And then the mature egg is right here. When we go to thaw eggs in the lab, and this is something really important because if you do choose to go through something like this, it's really important to ask the center that you're at how many eggs they've been able to freeze and thaw themselves because freezing and thawing an egg is actually a little bit of a harder thing to do than freezing or thawing an embryo. An embryo has about 100 cells in it. It's a pretty robust, um, well, we're very careful with them too, but it's more robust because if a few cells die in the freeze thaw process, the embryo is still usually able to survive that freeze thaw process. But an egg is a single cell. And so if it doesn't survive, it doesn't survive. Um, and it actually is, it, it's for other reasons, a little bit more technically challenging too. But in a good lab's hands, about 80 to 90% of those eggs will survive when they're actually, when you actually go to thaw them. And in normal, good, optimal circumstances, if you fertilize good quality eggs, about 80% of them will fertilize. And in optimal conditions, when we grow an embryo out to about five to six days of life, about 40% will develop. And um, this is a blastocyst. So this is the embryo that Carrie was alluding to where we take some of the cells from it. We have to wait for it to get to this stage before we can biopsy it. Um, most of the time, but the, uh, the goal is really to biopsy a couple of the cells that become the future placenta, because that's a lot safer to do than biopsy some of the cells that become the baby. And the cells in the placenta should reflect 
95% of the time, the cells that become um, the baby. And so the number of normal embryos that we get at the end of the day is really based on two things. Number one, the number of follicles that we start with, because that will determine how big our funnel is to begin with. And number two, age. Because in women who are less than 35, we expect that the majority of the embryos will be normal, meaning the number of chromosomes will be normal. And then in women who are greater than the age of 39, it's one in four, and that quickly gets much, much worse. So um, that number really determines just as a basis how many normal embryos we even have to screen for specific genetic mutations. And so it's really, really important in this, in this scenario, if there's a way to optimize, to think about it um, while we're still in a time that we can optimize. And then each normal embryo that we have has about a 50 to 65 percent chance of becoming a baby. And so the good news is, is that if we can get three normal embryos, which is harder for some than others, um, then there's a 95% chance of pregnancy after three consecutive embryo transfers. But optimizing these numbers while you're, while you're young is sometimes something that you can, you can consider doing by making eggs now and going through these stages of fertilization, embryo development, and embryo biopsy testing. Um, if you have a partner and you have a plan um, and you have a, a known sperm source, then you can go through all of these stages and freeze embryos and still keep whatever reproductive potential you currently have optimized, knowing that it's it's going to always be harder in the in in the in the future. Just what the differential is is really important to look at in terms of what your overall goals are, right? Some people want one kid, some people want more than one kid. Some people want big families and some people are comfortable with, um, with backup options like donor sperm or donor egg, which are always good backup options and you don't have to rush to them in terms of success rates. Um, those success rates are sort of frozen in time for you already. So this is what a typical stimulation protocol looks like just to get a general sense of it. It's about two um, two weeks from the beginning to the end. It's about eight to 12 days of injections. It's a lot of injections and a lot of monitoring. And the way that we do the monitoring is by a transvaginal ultrasound um, and blood draws. And the actual procedure to remove the eggs is actually pretty short. Um, this is what it looks like. This is just a schematic of it. We put an ultrasound into the vagina. The ovaries fall very close to the vagina. And so we can put a very thin needle through the vaginal wall into the ovary, aspirate each egg within its follicle where it's growing in a little pool of fluid. And then we're able to put it into a test tube, look at it underneath the microscope, and then do everything that we need to do in the lab, either to freeze it or to fertilize it, grow it to embryo, biopsy it, freeze the embryo. And we do freeze all embryos in this sense because we freeze the embryo so that we have time to get the results back. It takes time to get the results back before we find out the results. And then later on, whether that's delaying for, for because you're not ready to have a kid or just going forward with the next month, we saw the embryo and we transfer it in a subsequent month. So this is just what a surgical procedure room looks like. And this is what our embryology lab looks like. It's just sort of fun to be able to see inside of these faces. Um, and once we freeze an egg or once we freeze an embryo, we really don't think that there's any impact to keeping it frozen for a short period of time versus a long period of time. Um, eggs and embryos should be able to survive longer in life than we are able to survive. Not that I recommend um, that you transfer it at, at you know, exceedingly late times in life. Um, and it's a fairly safe um, procedure. So it is a surgery. We just put a needle inside of an organ. And so um, for most people, that's kind of like getting a blood draw. You know, if I draw blood from your arm, I don't have to give you stitches to stop your arm from bleeding, right? I just put pressure and then your arm doesn't keep like spouting out blood. Well, in most of the case, the same is true when you put a needle inside the ovary. The ovary will just form a blood clot and there won't be any internal bleeding. But in about one in a thousand cases, we do see that patients will have more bleeding than their body can tolerate or an infection that develops from the needle. Or, but those cases are really pretty rare in terms of needing some follow-up for that. Severe hyperstimulation refers to a syndrome that occurs when you stimulate and you have multiple eggs, like typically greater than 30 eggs. And it's really just associated with your bloating and internal dehydration. 
Um, we have lots of tricks up our sleeve for this. And so I have never had to hospitalize someone for this. In the old days, we had to hospitalize patients quite often who um, had many, many eggs um, stimulated because of the elevated hormones. But we really don't see any permanent issue with patients. So we don't think this procedure increases your risk of hormonal cancers. We do not think this decreases your future fertility. Um, what most people experience is bloating and fatigue, sometimes headaches throughout the stimulation cycle, and then kind of like a worse PMS picture after before they get your before they get their period. So like sometimes emotional ups and downs and bloating and constipation um, in the time before getting your period after the egg retrieval. All right, so that's my basic stuff. Thank you, that, that was so helpful. And now um, Troy's gonna tell us why it is so important to really consider this when you're thinking about um, future children. So Troy, if you can talk to us about the importance of HLA matching and match siblings, et cetera. You bet. So I just have only two slides to show. Uh, just to explain the HLA, uh, <clears throat> this is the first one showing uh, the chromosome where the HLA proteins are located, and that's chromosome six. Um, wait, wait, if you think you're displaying, we don't see your slides. Oh. Well, let me do this. Oh, here we go. Now we got it. All right. Thanks. Got it now? Perfect. Yep, so chromosome six, the HLA complex, it's a lot of different proteins. Uh, they're all lettered. Uh, they're called A, uh, C, B, D, R, D, Q. These are all each different proteins. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, ignore the order. They, they are where they are. Uh, and there's no really good rationale to why they're named this way. It's just there's a lot of them and letters are running out. Um, so now the example I like to give is HLA A protein actually is 200 different forms. So not just one protein, it's 200 proteins. And we just call the forms with a number code after the letter. So there's a form called HLA A0101. Uh, and the other thing you need to know that each child has two copies of A protein, of the letter A protein, because one comes from mom, one comes from dad. And so a child might have HLA A0101 and HLA A0304. This is what we're trying to match, uh, these letter number codes. And we're doing this across a lot of proteins. So it's very complicated. Um, there's another protein called B that has 400 forms. Same story, two copies of that. Uh, luckily, these uh, HLA proteins are inherited as big blocks of genes. So they're all on a single chromosome. So you usually get them all together. And so you get one copy from mom, one from dad. The odds of two siblings matching perfectly is one in four, so 25%. Uh, the terms that are out there uh, that people throw around are the six of six, the eight of eight, the 10 of 10. Uh, these are terms we use, uh, we use to say how many and what proteins we're looking at. Uh, six of six is the old term. What were we looking at for six of six? We were looking at the A, the B, and the DR. And so uh, again, each person has six, cop has six uh, proteins because two copies of A, two copies of B, and two copies of DR, each with their own number code. So that's the six of six. As our technology is better and more refined and our, as our science is better, we've expanded this uh, based on a lot of the outcome data over the last two, three decades to include more HLA proteins. So now we're at 10 of 10. Uh, we're looking at A, B, C, D, R, uh, and D, Q. And there's some other ones we look at as well. You can actually go higher than 10 of 10. You can go 12 of 12. And um, there's actually a ton more proteins. But this is what we're talking about and where the nomenclature is coming from. 
why doesn't everybody say the same thing? Well, um, actually, it's becoming all the same. Uh, it depends on the speed of technology adopted by the groups doing the testing. So it's becoming more fashionable to say 10 of 10 and look at 10 of 10. Um, so looking at the main proteins. Uh, historically, universities and testing facilities would use their own technology for typing, and so that's why it took a while for everyone to catch up and do the same thing. Um, we are a lot better at it now, and so our levels of detail are much, much greater. Again, each of these proteins has so many different forms, and you have to go in to determine the exact amino acid sequence for each form. Uh, it's a daunting task, and it's done by molecular biology techniques nowadays. Um, and so as all this technology moves forward, so hopefully we're getting to using the same nomenclature, which will be less confusing. That is to say 10 of 10. Okay, and then my last slide. All the transplant terms that people uh, throw around and talk about um, so I just put it in four big bubbles. Um, we have what I consider the gold standard transplant. That's the matched sibling bone marrow transplant. That's using the bone marrow from a brother or sister to transplant their sibling. This is where it's all started. This is the ruler stick to which all transplant outcomes are measured uh, in terms of efficacy. So I consider that the gold standard. Um, and we try to do those transplants today as much as possible, but as I just told you that the odds of a sibling matching to their other sibling is, is one in four, so it doesn't always happen. Uh, because of that, uh, programs such as Be The Match started, which allows us to match people uh, across the country that might match on those major proteins. Uh, in fact, we can match people across the world. And so we can do a transplant, uh, normally using bone marrow from an unrelated adult person uh, through the Be The Match. And you have to be an adult uh, to donate. So that's another type of transplant. It does take uh, some time to coordinate that type of transplant, often up to eight weeks. The third type is uh, the unrelated umbilical cord blood. And so around the country, uh, there are cord blood banks. Um, many of them are public banks uh, where the cord blood's kept for free. There are private banks uh, where you can pay to have your own cord blood stored uh, should uh, uh, the need arise to use it for reasons I won't go into. But anyway, between the public and private banks, they're all HLA typed, so we know what the uh, what a potential match looks like. So when you go do, an, do a search, you can do a search against all the cord blood units, public and private, and perform an umbilical cord blood transplant. Uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, this is unrelated. So the cord blood does not, uh, it is not from a brother and sister, but that's actually changing uh, as more and more people store cord blood. But for this argument, it's an unrelated umbilical cord blood. And then finally, the uh, next type of transplant is autologous ex vivo lentiviral modified transplant. So that's also known as gene therapy. Uh, this is using uh, the patient's own cells uh, and then infecting it with a lentivirus that encodes for the correct version of ABCD1 and giving it back to the patient in a transplant. Um, this uh, this transplant is in clinical trials. There has been uh, one uh, large paper summarizing the first part of the results. It is sponsored by Bluebird Bio, and uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll be wrapping up uh, the next part of the trial. The company then needs to go to the FDA to get approval to use this as a, uh, a medicine, essentially, and then uh, it'll find its place being adopted amongst the treating community. Uh, and so those are my two slides, uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, challenge you with some of the questions that came in, and one of them actually was related to your last slide, which had to do with, um, well, the first question was, are mass siblings the best option, which you use the term gold standard, but then the next question was, is that better than gene therapy, if you want to address that? Yeah, I get the question. I get the question a lot during counseling and consenting. Uh, it, it's easier for people to kind of put things in good, better, best categories 
but it's difficult to do that with transplantation because each family will have various options available to them. I can just say that matched sibling transplants, the gold standard, the results in that type of transplant uh, are certainly superior to unrelated adults and most superior to umbilical cord blood as well. Uh, gene therapy is not yet FDA approved as a transplant method and will have to go through the approval process and, and then uh, be adopted by the community at large, likely performed at select centers. It's also in clinical trials, so it definitely won't be available to everybody at, uh, for all time. So um, I guess I would just phrase it that way and try, instead of trying to put it in a pecking order. Um, and as time goes on and the years, goes, years go by, people get treated and these standards may change uh, in any of these bubbles. Um, there's investigations now using mothers and fathers as transplant donors. Uh, I'd even put that up there, but that's a haplotransplant. It's not something we commonly do for ALD today, but it has been done and it may be ground uh, in the future, so. Thank you all, this is great. Okay, so now a, a couple questions on IVF. You know, we talked about the procedure itself, how, you know, what's involved both from a embryo testing as well as the procedure itself. So clearly this costs a lot. So the question is, what's involved in insurance coverage? And I know that's a complicated question, but maybe- Yeah, it's a, it's a super complicated question that's probably getting more complicated and not less complicated with time. So the, the first thing to know is that by and large, most fertility preservation, even if it's for a good medical indication such as this, is not covered by traditional insurance. There are insurance companies that are um, starting to evolve that are, that are now very much linked with a lot of the big tech companies that try to use this as a recruitment strategy to get people to join their companies. But um, companies like Apple, Facebook, Google, and a lot of new companies are jumping on board that will purchase for you subsidized insurance and it will cover something as extensive as either egg freezing elect, you know, electively to optimize for the future or even embryo um, creation, testing, um, transfer, and, and the whole shebang. And so the insurance companies that are currently doing that, to my knowledge, are called Progeny. Um, and there's a newer one and that's a little bit more, I haven't seen it all over the place, but in the Bay Area called Carrot. And I think that, you know, if I were a, a young person who knew that I couldn't necessarily afford this, that I had any flexibility in, in my early jobs, this isn't something I actually wouldn't look into is what jobs, what job coverage would offer this kind of coverage, because it may make a really big impact on how much this costs for you, um, either now or later on down the line. Um, there are states that cover infertility coverage as a mandate. Um, and that's always changing as well. Um, so I do know that there are states that, you know, this would be considered if you had this um, as a diagnosis and you wanted to go through IVF with PGD, there, are, there may be states that mandate your insurance has to cover it, but that's gonna be different um, depending on what your state you're gonna, you live in. And so I would learn that information. And again, like if it's something that's really meaningful for you, I think that I moved to Texas because medical education was really affordable there became a resident, stayed there for a few years, ate a lot of Texas food. And now I live in California. You know, I think when you're young and you're movable, it, that might be a realistic thing to, to consider. Um, but an egg freezing cycle typically costs about anywhere between like 12 and $15,000 per time that you do it. Um, and an embryo freezing cycle probably costs anywhere between like 20 to $30,000 each time that you do it. So these are expensive things. Now, I always like to think about the context of, of what's more expensive, right? Going one through one cycle now or going through potentially two to three cycles later. That's also complicated, right? Because you have to factor in long-term storage fees. You have to factor in um, lost money that you could be investing, the loss, loss of investment. Those are real, real things, you know? Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, how, you know, affording something now that's as a young person, that's $12,000 may be harder now than it is later. Um, but that being said, I think that these costs always have to be also viewed in the context of, of cost savings. 
right? And so at the end of the day, it's a very expensive thing to have a child with lots of medical needs. And, um, and, and, and that's just, and, that, and I'm just talking about a purely financial argument. Like obviously there's lots of emotional things wrapped up in these decisions as well that we should not, you know, not get, that, that needs to be considered too about how you feel about this. You know, I think one personal story, story that I'll share is that when I got pregnant with my first child, um, I found out that I was pregnant with a son before I got my testing done, um, which was really emotionally very hard on me. And when I went to ask my cousin if I if he could share his sequencing information with me, it was really actually kind of hard on him because I didn't go the route of of, of testing and then pre, pre PGT. I went the route of getting pregnant and then post testing. And, um, and, and people feel really different about terminations and, and it brings up a lot of, of emotion, you know, and it brought up a lot of emotion for him. Like you're telling me that you would consider terminating a child who is like me and that, you know, ultimately we were able to really talk those things out, but I think that it's, there's a lot tied into all of that. But if we're talking about pure cost, I think that as much money as IVF is up front, as much money as egg freezing might be up front, I think that there's no question to me about what's more expensive, um, raising a child with a with a with a terminal condition or with a, a very difficult condition, all those associated costs versus these costs up front, um, whether or not your insurance covers it or doesn't cover it. And there are lots of programs now that are really doing a good job trying to make this affordable for patients, like um, whether it's grants or um, companies that help you get specific loans or um, payment systems. Um, and, and so those are those really vary in different centers, but certainly if being able to afford like a $15,000 thing up front isn't in your possibility space, there's ways of paying it in over time as well. I mean, if I can add only because I work in Massachusetts, which is a mandated state, and I've had colleagues tell me they've moved from like New, in the area, New Hampshire, Vermont to Massachusetts because they could get everything covered. Of course, it depends on your insurance company, but when you hear these kind of costs, you would consider moving or changing jobs just to do it. And they have, you know, nice, healthy family. So it, and, and I will say there's a patient advocacy group called Resolve that deals with, uh, that supports infertility families. And one of their primary goals is to get it mandated in every state. And like, for example, New York just got it mandated um, this year. So hopefully it's changing, but it is, we understand it's a challenge right now. Well, and I would also add, from a laboratory standpoint, I think if somebody's thinking about IVF and PGTM, the laboratory costs are probably the smaller piece of the cost. Um, but it's become increasingly that insurance companies, you know, they negotiate with labs. And so some of these labs do other things and there's in network. I mean, we are in network with many insurance plans. My experience is many will cover a lot of the PGTM portion of it. Um, not all, but a lot will, or a considerable portion of it. Um, but I also think when we're talking about a condition that affects a child versus maybe an adult onset, you know, somebody's interested in doing a cancer gene, for example, there is much more success in appealing. So I often have people start this conversation, see what lab you would use. If you don't have coverage, I would start an appeal process for something that a couple is that you know, we put carrier females for this disorder as something to consider as well. So I would talk about 50% risk. It's, there may be a way of actually getting coverage. Um, it's a fight and you have to be willing to do that, that work, but I have seen some people get coverage. Um, I have also seen, and I don't know if Dr. Vaughn has, I've seen where somebody has no IVF coverage, but they will cover PGTM, which makes no sense to me, except that the way insurance billing happens, it's all based on codes and we use very generic lab codes. Um, so there's different pieces to this process and you may get some things covered or may not, but I would also encourage, uh, this is an area I would also appeal, especially if, from a laboratory, the testing portion, um, we've had success. We write letters, we help. Um, it's not always covered, but more often than not when it's a childhood disorder. Yeah, I, I, I totally relate to that. I had to fight to get my testing covered when I was pregnant because it didn't automatically get covered. And I think that, you know, there's, 
there, there definitely is like insurance companies at the end of the day, their job is to make money, right? And so if they understand that the financial argument is this $25,000 treatment is going to save you hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars long-term and in, in going through, you know, what, what, what may happen as a result of not doing this treatment, I think they'll listen to that argument. It's not always straightforward, the appeals process, um, right. but it's there for a reason. So, so thank you. The next question, um, and now that, thank goodness, there's newborn screening in many of the states, people are getting an early warning. So if you're a family where your newborn child was diagnosed and you want to be prepared for the case that potentially they'll need a bone marrow transplant and you want to have um, an HLA match sibling, when should you start considering it? So you have a newborn and you're thinking, well, I have probably a few years before anything happens. How do you think about planning for that? Well, the first thing is that you can't do IVF while you're breastfeeding because breastfeeding, while it's very important for children, um, causes your body to secrete a hormone called prolactin, which is something that suppresses your, um, your hormonal system. And so um, certainly I wouldn't say IVF with a newborn is easy for anybody, but the first thing is really to complete the stage of breastfeeding um, your baby and just go through the recovery. Um, in general, we also recommend at least a one year, um, ideally 18 months, but at least at minimum a one year interpregnancy interval. Um, which is the time that you deliver until the time that you next conceive um, for health of the next pregnancy, because short inter pregnancy intervals are associated with increased risks of poor growth, preterm labor, um, and some other maternal risks as well. And so I would say, give it a year, um, you know, meet with the specialists, understand what's happening, um, and, and then you could come and see someone like me. And, and I would add to that, I would, I would, if it is a really something you're interested in, I would connect with the lab ASAP. I work with many couples, not just with ALD, but other conditions where they have a newly diagnosed or an affected child, infant, but it takes the lab a while. We review cases, we get those samples. It takes 10 weeks to build primers. The, what we build to do this testing doesn't go away. It doesn't expire. It doesn't get used up. It is much, much more advantageous to be doing it when you're not under a time pressure that I want to do an IVF cycle next month. Let whatever lab you're using get ready. So in some ways, if that feels like it, this pathway would be a fit, working with a lab up front is not a bad idea because we need a lot of time and it takes getting samples. And if all the testing hasn't been done, you're going to need to do some DNA testing. And to be working on that without a time sensitive ending in it would be really advantageous. And I do a lot, I, I do a lot with couples. They may not be ready to do an MVF cycle for a year, but they're going to get everything in place with the lab that's testing. Yeah. I, I, I try to answer families questions to the best of my ability directly. So the median time for transplant historically has been age seven, but those are children um, that had family history or that were caught later now with newborn screening, the whole program is going to shift. We're going to have all these children in MRI surveillance programs. We're going to pick up uh, the lesions as early as possible. And my guess, it'll shift down to about age four. Uh, that's a very rough estimate. Um, the earliest I've seen cerebral disease is uh, two and nine months or something like that. But I'm going to say, you know, we're going to be catching kids in the a four to five age range, again, as a ballpark. So if people want to plan around that, um, at least it puts a number to it, but it's by no means a guarantee. Dr. Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask you a question. I, I maybe I missed this, but is anyone doing HLA matched sibling cord blood transplant? Um, yeah. Yeah, there are more and more of those um, uh, these days. It does depend on, on kind of the donor's weight and the quality of the cord blood. So after you do all this, there are quality issues with collecting the cord blood stem cells and we have to meet that criteria. Um, but yeah, there, there are those transplants. Actually, we were the first university to do those types of transplants. And the cord blood is probably similar to bone marrow, I would say. Um, you know, if presented with a six month old bone marrow donor versus having their cord blood, 
because there's risks of anesthesia to the six month old and drawing their marrow, that's the perfect scenario for goodness. Uh, I'm glad we collected that cord blood. Um, if you can um, also expand on if, I mean, somebody commented and it, it is not only expensive, but it's, it's a process as we've heard. If they can't do it, what are their chances that they may have a child with ALD? And if they do, and it's a boy, what's the chances that they will come down with a cerebral demyelination? I guess, Troy, you know those numbers offhand. Uh well, the chances of cerebral demyelination are 30 to 40 percent uh, for all comers with um, ALD. So, and that's the that's the ballpark estimate based on the studies to date. Um, I'll leave the door open for everything to change once all the newborns that are screened have been uh, have have found their path, I guess. But 30 to 40 percent of the boys will develop the cerebral lesion. Oh, 25% chance of having a girl that's unaffected. It's a 25% chance of having a boy that's unaffected. It's a 25% chance of having a girl that's a carrier that may have some disease in life. And there's a 25% chance of having a boy that's a, a, affected. And just to add to the, um, if you got out of jail free and weren't among the 30, 40% to get cerebral as a child, what are the odds that you're really going to be symptom free by the time you're 40? <laughs> yeah, that it comes up a lot. Um, the, the problem is um, we don't know the denominator. I have no idea how many people are out there with ALD who have not been diagnosed, um, either asymptomatic or symptomatic. Uh, there are a few schools of thought that perhaps every man will develop some symptom by age 80 or 90. Like that's a full lifespan, but given what we know about the disease that perhaps something will develop. If it develops at 70, perhaps, but maybe some things will, will develop at age 30. There's so much we don't know about it, but we do consin continue, uh, consider it kind of a spectrum illness. Um, so there's just no way to predict, but that's why we have all the surveillance programs and anyone with ALD should be seeing their neurologist physician every year, of course, looking for these things. Great. And one question on the testing. So someone was asking, is there a way to test rather than waiting to create the embryos and test the embryos? Could you check if the eggs, um, are, uh, yeah. A bad ex yeah, not at, not at this time, um, basically because an egg is a single cell, in order to test it, you would by definition have to destroy it. Um, and so there's really, you could potentially test it, but you wouldn't have anything to save as a result. Um, there's certainly lots of companies and things that are working on trying to get things that are secreted from eggs, but it's really, there's, it's nowhere near um, use. Okay, so I went through the questions that um, were posted. If, if anybody, I'm looking online, I don't see anybody posting questions. I'll just uh, wrap up with a couple of questions to give people an opportunity, um, but please do post in the Q&A. So um, you talked about the cycle, and I think, Carrie, you gave an example where one of the cycles, complete bus, no embryos to transfer. From the time they come to your office, let's even assume they have a test already made with a Natira. How long would you say it would take from they come to see you, they have their appointment until you even know if that cycle is successful? Um, IVF takes about three months. So in general, and, and, and every center is a little different in terms of how quickly they get you started, but it's typically about a month to get all the preparation done. If you're building the test from scratch, then we say that this preparation time is usually about three to four months. Um, and then it takes, about, but every case is different, right? And so some may take longer. Um, it takes about a month to go through the stimulation, create the embryos, get the embryo um, results. And then it takes about a month to transfer the embryo. So it's, uh, yeah, it takes a little, it takes a little while, but also in some ways, I think shorter than people expect. I think people are always surprised by how long the whole process takes but surprised that the actual time of injections and monitoring is less than two weeks. And I would comment that once a lab, and it doesn't matter, Natera, whoever, 
has done this prep for the couple, if they need a second cycle, that piece is done. Like once it's built for this family, it can be used again. They don't do necessarily that piece of obtaining samples and building the platform and all of that. But I will add, because sometimes people ask me too, you know, I've got, I'm working with a patient and she's got a sister who's also a carrier and she's done all this work with Natera. Can't her sister just use this primer we built? And that answer is no, because this is looking at unique DNA sequences in her around the variant, and they will be different in her sister. So once it's built for one person in the family, it cannot be shared with other family members either. So even kind of thinking time, one, you know, one sibling may say, I did all this, maybe it will save my other sibling some time. It doesn't work that way, at least not yet. So do you have a sense of, on average, how many cycles um, an infertile couple does before they have a child or give up? And then when they're going through PGTM, how many cycles it usually takes just to give people a sense of, because it's, it's so, it's very so much. And, and I think that the most important thing is to understand like your prediction initially based on your age and ovarian reserve. And then also, um, uh, you know, like the, the, there are unknown things that come up ultimately. So when I say 80% fertilization, half of those embryos will make it to the blast stage. 25% of those embryos will be completely unaffected, right? 50% of them might be something you would consider, or 50% 50 will be completely unaffected. 75% might be something you're willing to transfer if you're willing to transfer a carrier girl, um, we can come up with those prediction models of whether or not we think you're going to need on average one cycle, two cycles, or if it's very unrealistic that we're going to be able to easily go down this road. But the laws of, like with small numbers, small numbers don't follow the laws of statistics. And so okay. So somebody posted a very interesting question. I don't think they're looking for stats. They're just kind of looking for anecdotes. So does anybody know of a family that went through this and got an embryo that was you know, you ploy, no ALD, and yeah, was yeah. HLA, and was an HLA I, match. And I would say that, well, I don't know about HLA match, that throws an extra, like, but the more things you test for, the less likely you are to be successful the first right. round. But I would say most people are successful with IVF the first round in their 20s. Most people in their mid-30s to need a, on average two cycles per desired baby. And most people in their forties have to go through multiple cycles to get a single baby. And that's just without the additional testing, okay? So if you say that someone in their twenties is probably gonna have to go through one cycle, that's probably still gonna be true, right? If you consider that they're gonna cut, their embryos are most likely gonna be normal. We might have to remove about 25 to 30% of them for being just having made an error and the embryo is abnormal. And then we're going to remove at bet like 25% for being total, totally diseased and 50% if you're really not willing to have a carrier female as well. So you're really likely to have a normal embryo in there as long as your ovarian reserve is as normal as we would expect you to be in your twenties. It starts to get harder with ovarian aging and, and it depends on where you are in the threshold of ovarian aging and also how many, how, what your ovarian reserve is. And so I tell all women, regardless of like, if you want kids in the future, you should just know what your ovarian reserve is. You should know, is it normal? Is it a little higher? Is it abnormal? No matter what it is, it's not gonna protect you from ovarian aging, which happens to everyone, 36, 37, egg quality starts to decline, right? If you're ever planning on delaying fertility past 36, 37, you should be thinking about whether or not this would optimize your goals or delaying any child born after that age, right? But in terms of like how easy this is gonna be for you in your twenties versus your early thirties, for example, that'll really depend on your ovarian reserve. If your ovarian reserve is really high, like let's say you have 30 antral follicles. Well, we're not gonna put most likely push you to get 30 eggs at any point in the next couple of years because you're gonna over stim. And so you're gonna hyper stim, you're gonna get sick. So the number of eggs that you would get over the next couple of years is gonna be pretty similar. Um, anyways. And so you're not going to have diminished, like you're not going to have worsening outcomes for at least a period of time for the most part. But those, those numbers of success rates, honestly, like I totally always appreciate the question and the anecdotes, but the anecdotes vary so widely that when patients are like, it's going to take me two cycles. Like this is the budget that I have. It always has to be viewed in terms of your ovarian reserve and your age. And 
anecdotes end up being, I would say more harmful than useful because then you're just comparing yourself and no one, there's always someone who did better than you. And there's some, always someone who did worse than you. There's a lot of uncontrolled or till you go through this, till you've seen it. Um, I think from a laboratory standpoint, a lot of the cases for PGTM for ALD that we have done have not been for HLA matching. When I look and pull, we've done this a lot, but it's been more, um, there's a family history of this. The person who's coming to us has actually not had a child. So we've not done as much HLA for it. So I think my numbers on sh are small. And so I'm always cautious to share that. When we look at all the disorders we've done HLA matching for, we did this last year, we're looking it's at least two cycles. Um, it's pretty rare on the first cycle to get unaffected, chromosomally normal, and an HLA match. Um, but I think most of our patients are not in their 20s. So, you know, that would be adding to Dr. Vaughn's about thinking about this ahead. Most of my patients are over 35. So it's going to take two cycles because we're not getting that number from one cycle. And Troy, do you know, just from the transplant world, have you had some matched um, siblings that came through the IVF route through HLA uh, mission? Yes, there, there, are, there are matched siblings from IVF PGD. Um, have we used any in transplant yet? Not for ALD, but for a whole host of uh, a variety of other diseases. Uh, it's probably more than 100 transplants actually out there using this process. Well, that's very, okay, so that's super encouraging. I mean, really encouraging. Right. And by the way, I'll, I, not that I wanna brag about how old I am, but don't get discouraged just because I didn't get an uh, unaffected uh, HLA match. I mean, I was, I'm embarrassed to say, I was in my late, late, late 30s. I won't say 40, late, late 30s. And for those of you who have done IVF, that's like 200 years old when you go into an IVF clinic. But the fact that I have a healthy child, I'm just saying if I would have known and started earlier, there's a good chance I could have, you know, then, then beat the odds. But so don't get discouraged just because I didn't get an HLA match. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear Troy say there's hun hundreds like that. I didn't know that we, we've gotten to that point. So that's very encouraging. A couple other questions. So one is, okay, um, how do I connect with the lab to start getting my test and primer done? Um, you normally I'd want you to go through an IVF provider because we are most and I'm, I don't think any of the these type of labs are direct to consumer. A patient can't call up and say, I'm really interested in doing PGTM testing. This has to become as an order test, a referral, a recommendation from an IVF provider. Um, so you're going to need to get in with a Dr. Vaughn or somebody like that who would start that process. Even if you're not starting the IVF process, they would start that communication with the lab. There are not tons of us. I mean, there are a handful. So whoever is in your area, and even if you start with an IVF provider and you end up changing, the lab can stay the same. But to start that communication, I mean, you can research it. There's only a few of us, but we will sometimes initially talk to somebody, but we can't open a case. We can't review it. We can't do anything until your provider orders it. So I would start with an IVF provider. So maybe Sarah, any advice on how you choose your IVF provider if you know that you're gonna to have to do PGTM in particular? Yeah, yeah. well, the first thing is um, if you have a generalist or a general OBGYN who's worked with someone before, they're always a good resource to just ask them. Um, I really like a website called Fertility IQ. It's, I was gonna um, say that. <laughs> yeah, it was a website that was started by um, some patients for better patient education about the process. It has a lot of really good resources um, educational materials on IVF that really break things down for patients that it's in a very um, uh, digestible, understandable way and, and very accurate and evidence-based. And they actually review um, all fertility doctors and there's a portion of their website dedicated to, you can look up a, doc, a specific provider if you're interested, or you can look up an area of the country and you can read reviews that have been validated from patients about their doctors. So that's a really helpful place. You can really get a general sense of like, different doctors' personalities. I think that this is a long, it's a journey. I always tell patients like IVF is a marathon. If you prepare for a sprint and then you run a marathon, you will hate me. If you prepare for a marathon, we happen to sprint, you'll be fine. So um, you want to make sure that you find someone who's just like their personality vibes with yours. You're going to spend a lot of time together. Um, you're going to, you know, it's, it's a fairly intimate procedure to go through. Um, and so that's a really good way of just finding someone who fits you. I think most IVF 
centers in the United States are really good um, and, and, and we're really lucky in that way. Um, we have very good subspecialty training for all of our doctors. You really should look for someone that is um, either board certified or board eligible in reproductive endocrinology and fertility as a minimum. Um, that's just like a basic way of keeping people safe. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of really, really wonderful specialists out there. So I think that's a pretty um, easy thing to do, especially with the pandemic. Now, a lot of people are offering virtual appointments so you can sign up for something, someone virtually as well. Great. So Troy, this is, I'm not sure why we didn't get to this. This is a pretty common question. So if you have an uh, ALD embryo female, that's an HLA match, would you think that's a good match for an affected brother? So it's an HLA match female with ALD. Yeah, we'd have, to, so it, it comes up a lot. We have to um, see what other options there are for that individual. And the problem is my own opinion changes on this. Uh, mm -hmm. from time to time, I would have to review with the family considering this, the specific outcomes of the three patients we've transplanted with um, carrier siblings. And, and that's usually what I do for the families is we go through patient A, B, and C. I explain the diagnosis, uh, the status of the patient, and go through the outcomes and, and kind of what I think about the transplant. Because it's 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 not our first choice, but we've done it uh, three times in the past, probably 15 years. Uh, so it's definitely doable. Um, again, you, you'll have one gene affected by, um, by ALD, and that gene is, uh, is subject to uh, X chromosome silencing as that child ages. So there could be future manifestations of disease uh, in that child. And those are the, the details that I go over with the family considering it, but I don't automatically dismiss it and say, no, we would never do that. So. I have one more question. First of all, not surprisingly, a great shout out to Dr. Lund is our son. He's one, is our son's doctor. He's wonderful. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, Troy knows I'm a big fan of his, so not surprising he gets a shout out here. Um, so what, the question with that is the a woman who's 27 and about to go through um, stims for this. So if you had to predict how many eggs you're going to get for somebody who has a good ovarian reserve, um, any, I mean, I know it's a range, but if you could address that and maybe even of those number of eggs, how many embryos you may get. Yeah. So um, I would need more specifics, but ultimately we expect to get between 50 to 80% of the answer follicle count um, about 85% of the time. So that's our ability to predict number of eggs. So there's lots of different measures of ovarian reserve. There's AMH level, which is a hormone that the eggs in that intermediate stage secrete. Um, there is day three FSH level, which is sort of the old fashioned way of measuring ovarian reserve. None of us really look at that anymore. Um, and then there is the antral follicle count. And the antral follicle count is a test if you do a transvaginal ultrasound and you look at the ovaries and you look at the ovaries that look like chocolate chip cookies and you count the chocolate chips, then total number on both sides is your antral follicle count. And if you take that number and you multiply it, you know, you divide it in half and then you look at what eight, like between 50 to 80%, that's what I typically expect to get um, in terms of eggs. Now, how many embryos you get depends on a lot of different things. Um, it depends on whether or not there's normal sperm. It depends on whether or not there's any history of infertility. It depends on um, how your embryos do in culture. But in general, I expect about three to four eggs in a young person will result in one embryo that, um, that gets to the blastocyst stage. Again, when we take eggs and sperm outside of the body, we, not, we don't necessarily know what we are gonna expect to see. Even a couple that's starting from the very first day one, they've never tried to conceive before, they have no diagnosis of infertility. We would expect if they were trying for a year on their own, about 15% of them to have infertility, right? And so if you haven't even tested your fertility and you're not sure if you're fertile, we learn a lot through the process. Typically in the body, we don't know. We don't know why I didn't get pregnant this month. We didn't know, we don't know why I had a miscarriage that was early. We just don't have any testing for things that go inside, inside the body. In IVF, we do, but some of those breakdowns are sometimes also related to, um, to artificial conditions, right? Taking the eggs and the sperm out and embryos outside of their normal habitat and that causes some stress on them. So my advice to you as a 20, you know, a 27 year old 
with great ovarian reserve is wonderful. Like you're, you're in the highest group prognosis group and also cautious optimism, which is that IVF is both diagnostic and therapeutic. It's a learning process and it's stressful. And that, especially that part where you can't control it is stressful. And so, you know, therapists talk constantly about the two week wait. The two week wait is the wait between transfer and embryo pregnancy tests, insemination pregnancy tests, having sex around the time of ovulation pregnancy test. Um, and there's a two week wait with embryo report, which is you get the eggs and then you have to wait for the embryo report. So I would recommend um, an app called Ferticom. I, um, it's F-E-R-T-I and then C-A-L-M. It was a free app that was sponsored by a drug company, but ultimately developed by a really wonderful um, reproductive therapist at um, uh, in, in one of the Harvard programs. Her name is Alice Domar. She is um, really, really brilliant and has been with lots of families who've been going through this process. Um, and it's basically a free app that really helps you with the psychological aspect of what you can control and what you can't control. Um, and some cognitive exercises and some meditations that you can do to sort of help you get through this process. Because I tell people all the time, like I am 50% therapist, 50% medical doctor, right? There's a really big emotional aspect to this journey. And I would love if I could predict exactly how many embryos you'll have at the end of your span, like, you know, fingers and toes crossed that it's more than enough that you need. And you certainly are in an age group with ovarian reserve that's optimized to get the best results each cycle that anyone could get. Um, and to hold on to that optimism, but know that there's some things you can't control and then use the app for the two week wait. It's really helpful. This is great. I don't see other questions posted. I'll just ask the panelists. You guys are so amazing. I'm in awe. Is there anything that you think somebody should have asked as you think about it that you wanna make sure they know before they go to dinner or get some rest? <laughs> Depending, depending on which time zone. Oh wait, yeah, there is somebody saying thank you, which we'd like that. I just saw that pop up, but other things that people should, that people would add. I mean, I'll I just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Ground. We covered a lot of ground today. We did. And I have to say, I am thrilled to learn how many, how many successful cycles have resulted in finding unaffected HLA, even if it's not ALD, it's, it's a good example. I mean, I guess Troy would be the one to, to see that as a transplanter. So th this is great. I mean, I, if I can say, I'll, I'll quote my daughter who's 17. She's like, mom, sex is for recreation, science is for procreation. <laughs> oh man. From somebody who's from somebody who spent their first three years in the freezer. Okay. But no, I should, we shouldn't talk about it. No, this is really, you guys have been amazing. And, you know, there's so many different ways to build families and um, you guys have been so phenomenal at explaining it. And I think everyone knows your names now and how to reach you. And I'm not surprised that there's shout outs to you guys because you're all amazing. So, so we'll end with that and say, thank you so much. And, um, we hope that this uh, satisfied, the, I mean, answered the questions. If not, we're all available to help with this journey together. It's definitely a journey to grow a family and especially when you're um, using some really cool technology to have the healthy family that you always dreamed of. So have a good night. All right, thank you.